Okay, let us go into Himalayan earthquake. Okay, earthquake is again very important activity, and because of the happening of repeated earthquakes in the Himalayan region, especially after having a massive earthquake, uh, earthquake in Nepal, on the again on the western side, it is becoming very important. In this earthquake, we will be talking about how earthquake has been measured because see, last time there was a question about how cyclone is named. There was a cyclone known as Felin and how cyclone is named. So see, UPSC is not only interested about how cyclone is formed, in what kind of temperature it is formed, what is the path, what is the eye of a cyclone, what is its temperature, uh, weather condition that prevails when cyclone passes an area. See, UPSC is also interested in the naming process. Or how it is called, how it is not called. So let us see how earthquake is also measured. Okay, so let us start. See, <clears throat> what is this term? Seismic cape. In any region, means we all know, if there is a, in a black boundary, if there is a movement, there is going to be earthquake. That is an accepted principle. Now what will happen is, for actually uh, all the time, constantly all the time, there is a motion of plate. But we all know, because of friction and other properties, the motion does not take place regularly. There is a stress, initially there is a stress that has been built up on the plate or the plate boundary. And when that stress goes beyond the limit of this controlling plate, it releases. While there is a release of the pressure, there is a movement. And that movement is nothing but it's an earthquake. Okay. Now what will happen is, so, between one major earthquake and the other major earthquake, there will be a time gap. That gap is known as seismic gap. Now my question is, do a small earthquake release this tectonic stress and prevent a big one? The answer is no. Because see, the general principle is we all we always used to speak, uh, we always used to say, Himalayan region, in Himalayan region, there should be a six, seven earthquakes in one year. So that big earthquake does not happen in the future. But according to the research, it has been found that Geologists argue that the number of smaller earthquakes in the region has not sufficient to release the accumulated stress for a big one. Means, what is the final analysis of this? The big earthquake is going to happen irrespective of n number of small earthquakes that, that occurred. Okay. Second is, is it possible, is it possible that slow movement of rocks along the fall without earthquake rapture take some stress of the area. This is possible. But we are interested in what is this as seismic creep. As seismic creep is, there will be a motion, but there won't be an earthquake. Okay, that is called as seismic creep. It is just a term. Himalayan earthquake and regional cooperation. I am not going into the plate motion, uh, plate motion theory, okay? Because it is assumed you already know how earthquake is formed and where earthquakes are. Let us go into some different areas. Earthquake, Himalayan earthquakes and regional cooperation. Now, the geological reality is that the Himalayan lands and people are interlinked via natural processes transcending the belief, political follies or personal wishes. Am I right? The earthquake does not recognize here is Afghanistan, here is Pakistan, here is China. Earthquake is an earthquake. So when there is an earthquake that occurs in Himalayan region, the best example was in Nepal recently. Okay, India ha initially had very, uh, the response time was very less. But see, in this entire region, is earthquake prone area. This is Central Asia, this is Afghanistan, this is Pakistan, upwards there will be Tajikistan, in, this is China, again it will come Myanmar, everything. The natural phenomena does not recognize the political boundary of a country. The present political <laughs> demarcation is just a political demarcation. So, 
earthquakes are a norm rather than an exception in the Himalayan region. And because the physical feature like earthquakes does not recognize the political boundary, the regional cooperation for natural disasters like earthquakes becomes very important due to the repeated occurrences of earthquake in this region. Mutual understanding and cooperation among the Himalayan countries, this effort includes expanding and modernizing educational and research institutions in the region. Is it clear? Very simple. Engineering, strong houses and building. Very simple. Setting up a network of disaster relief and rescue team jointly operated by Himalayan countries. Simple. Now, you look at this. Wait, wait. Yeah, awareness and preparedness. How we will be aware and prepared for an uh, for earthquake-like activity because it is going to occur in India or in any Himalayan region. Although scientists are not able to predict the exact location and time of a large earthquake, several activities can help us to move in that direction. This includes putting in place an area of seismometers in the Himalayan to study the pattern and size of seismic tremors, setting up a network of seismic stations communicating critical information and signals to nearby down, increasing our knowledge of tectonic deformation and landscape changes by GPS measurement, geophysical survey and field geologic studies. All these activities require budget to which the international community should also help because the knowledge derived from such studies improve science itself. Now, this is how the early warning system will help to reduce the intensity or the destructiveness of an earthquake if we can cooperate in a regional in a regional scale suppose just by creating a warning early warning system in india or in nepal or in Afga afghanistan or myanmar it doesn't help because earthquake occurs in all the ranges earthquake that is occurring in nepal will affect india earthquake that is happening in afghanistan will affect india because earthquake will travel to India also. So we need a regional cooperation at the level of regional cooperation. So by how by having a regional cooperation, it helps us in our awareness and preparedness and how we you know face the challenge of an earthquake. Let us see this. These are these are sensors. Okay, these are earthquake sensors put in different locations. It will sense the vibration. When there is a vibration, it will sense because it is a sensor. <coughs> Once it senses, it will send a signal, radio uh, RF signal. It will send an RF signal to a station out here, receiver. This is known as a rece receiver for this particular signal, sensor. It will receive the signal and after that it will broadcast to other locations like emergency center station. So what will happen is, for example, this is the epicenter of an earthquake. There are many ways, you all know about what is surface wave, what is body wave, what is P wave, what is S wave. P wave strikes first. Intensity of P wave is much less. Destructiveness of P wave is much less. It is followed by S wave and gradually it is followed by the body or by the surface wave. Most destruction is caused by the surface wave itself. Now, when earthquake travels in this direction, the P wave is detected by this sensor. After detecting the signal of this P wave, it will immediately send the signal to a receiver. Once the receiver receives this, it will broadcast the information to emergency response or the, in India we will have this National Disaster Response Agency. Once they receive the information, they will disseminate the information. And certain activities will follow, which will reduce the effect of an earthquake. Okay, so this is how it is helping. And this can be done with the help of, this can be achieved only with the help of cooperation at the level of region, complete region. This is again for tsunami, tsunami or tsunami. 
Okay. These are sensors. When there is any disturbance on the sea surface, sea floor, there will be an effect on the height of the wave. And these changes in the height of wave, unusual changes, normal changes can be accumulated by these particular <coughs> sensors. But when there is unusual change in the sensors, it will send a signal to a satellite. And this sec uh, signal is sent to the satellite, and from the satellite it is broadcast to the <coughs> receiver station on the Earth's surface. And after that, it will send to other station and disseminate the information. And how? That is, and, and after that, gradually we will evacuate from the coastal region. And that is how we save the lives and property on the coastal region through tsunami. Okay. Let me ask you one question. Suppose you arrange like this. Earthquake occurs here, sensors here, this is building. Suppose if the earthquake occurs here, what will happen? <laughs> <laughs> you have to change the arrangement, no? <laughs> now, see, in life, everything is a game of probability. It's a chance. <laughs> okay. Now, let us go into Nepal earthquake. Let us see a little bit in detail about what is Nepal earthquake. What is Kathmandu Valley? Kathmandu Valley, it is a valley, no? It was a valley, and some people thought, it looks like a Kathmandu, so they say it is a Kathmandu valley. Okay. <laughs> so what is a valley after all? Valley is something like this, right? A river will flow. There will be a basin type structure, and this is a valley. That's why we call river valley. Okay. So when the river flows here, river will carry sediments. The position of sediments will take place, and after that. Gradually it will rise and it will become a valley. Or this is a valley itself. In the valley there was a deposition and that is how. So Kathmandu is such kind of valley. So what will happen is this mud or the the mud or the substance that is below Kathmandu or the Kathmandu is very soft, not so hard. It's very soft, not so hard. So what will happen is, when there is any motion, it is a basic physics, when there is a motion, or when there, when there is a vibration, the intensity of that vibration, or the wavelength of that vibration, intensity of that vibration, increases two or three times when it travels through a soft body. When it goes, when it passes through a hard body or a hard substance, it remains almost the same. But when it <coughs> goes through a soft body, it increases. So what happened in Nepal is, the Kathmandu Valley itself is made up of sedimentary rock, or the <coughs> alluvial deposition, or a lacquer strand deposition. So what happened is, the earthquake happened here. The, the earthquake, once it has happened, if it is in Richter scale, this is this magnitude, that is a fix. But we will be discussing later, in uh, intensity scale, it all depends upon the type of the rock. So this rock or this, uh, this valley is soft in nature. The vibration increased by three times. <coughs> so the level of intensity that was felt in the Kathmandu Valley was very high, than which was actually occurred in some, uh, the epicenter which happened some distance away from Kathmandu, okay. <coughs> this I'll discuss later. And that is one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why there was a lot of loss in life and property in Kathmandu Valley specifically. How resilient is India? Because India also is very vulnerable to earthquake. How resilient <coughs> India is? See, in India without even an earthquake, a building collapses. <laughs> <laughs> so what will happen if there is an earthquake? There will be a tsunami of building collapse, okay? And why is that problem? Because of non-implementation of building codes due to poor governance. This implication I'll show you in next slide. See, this is one of the examples. In 2010, there was an earthquake in Caribbean region known as Haiti. The casualties were 
two legs. Just after five weeks, there was an earthquake which was 500 times more than the earthquake that happened in Haiti in a location known as Chile in Southern America. What is the casualty? 800. What is the difference? See, more intensity, but casualty see. Why? Because Chile has an excellent building god and they practice very religiously. But in Haiti, no building god like India. No building god at all. So that is the reason of poor governance affecting the life and property. If we follow a proper building god, this is the advantage that or the benefit that we are going to get. <coughs> Investing in disaster prevention has really been a priority for our government. In adequate basic drill, the way forward is, please, you can just go through once. <coughs> Sentai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction 20, 2015. This is a framework. Through this framework, how to reduce the disaster risk is discussed. And I think we are also a signatory of this. So please go through once. Calls for substantial reduction of disaster reduction and losses in life. Okay, that is a broad idea about how Nepal earthquake is. Now, this is one, one thing, soil liquefaction. I hope you all know what is soil li liquefaction. It is a very simple term. It is related to the earthquake. Now, what will happen is, this is the profile. This is the ground surface. This is the sedimentary layer. And this is water saturated granular layers. This is how the profile of our crust, okay? The few surface below us, okay? Now, what will happen is, this is water saturated. But when there is, <coughs> when there is no vibration, when there is no movement, what will happen is, this is a water particle, this is a sand grain. The sand grain touch one another, in spite of the presence of the water molecules. This sand is touching this sand, this sand is touching this sand, and all the sand structure, see this is in molecular level. <coughs> so you can just imagine, okay? Just for the sake of simplicity, they have shown this diagram, but this one sand gravel, or the sand grains touch the other, the egg has a solid mass, like a sand, okay, a solid body. But when there is a vibration, what happens is, when there is a vibration, there is a detachment of one sand particle with respect to the other. And there is a flow of this water freely, okay. So now, this structure will behave like a fluid. Instead of a solid structure, because of the vibration, there is a detachment of one soil with the other, and the entire structure will flow like a fluid. So once it started to flow like a fluid, they will flow in a wavy pattern. And once it flow in a wavy pattern, once it stuck the upper surface, this upper surface will come up, there will be a crack, there will be a fissures. And that is how fissures is created while earthquake happens. And that is how cracks and upliftment of land surface, depression of land surface happens because of soil liquefaction. With the soil liquefaction, you can explain how there is a crack, how there is a fissure, how there is upliftment of land surface, how there is subduction in the land surface, okay? Earthquake measuring scale, please. The severity of an earthquake is described by both magnitude and intensity. You know, magnitude relates to Richter scale, <coughs> intensity relates to Merkley scale. Now, magnitude usually is expressed in Arabic numerals. These are very simple, but in contrast, okay, these are very simple, just go through. But let me come here. Ideally, any given earthquake can be described by any one magnitude, but many intensities since the earthquake affect vary with circumstances such as distance from the epicenter and local soil condition. Is it okay? Yeah. Unlike magnitude scale, intensity scale do not have a mathematical basis. Instead, they are an arbitrary ranking based on observed effects. Most of seismic intensity scale 
have 12 degrees of intensity. The <coughs> local magnitude scale, also popularly known as Richter scale, is a quantitative local <coughs> rhythmic scale. This is important because the difference between 6 and 7 or 6 <coughs> and 6.1 in the Richter scale or any difference is uh, in the factor of 10. Okay, because it's a local mid scale. It goes like this. Suppose if we plot in a this is y axis, x axis. What is this? This is linear. What is logarithmic? make? It is it goes up like this. Okay. It is not gradual. So six and seven will be ten times more. Something like that. Okay. So I appreciate that. Suppose if somewhere earthquake measuring five register somewhere <coughs> six, then you will have to imagine in this respect. So we all know there are basically two, that is, first one is the magnitude scale. What about the magnitude? The magnitude is the amount of energy that is released. That is the magnitude. Amount of energy that is released is known as a magnitude scale and that is known by the name Richter. The other is the intensity or the destructiveness and that is called Merkelis. There are two, but mind you, they have some problem. One problem is about a, they become saturated very soon. In a sense, say for example, Richter scale saturates at around 6 or around 8. <coughs> what is the meaning of it? It detects and gives us the right reading till the actual magnitude of the earthquake was in the scale of 6 to 7. But when it goes beyond 7, maybe 9 in actual, but this scale, since it has already saturated, after that saturation point, it is not going to reflect correspondingly. So we will be getting a wrong measurement on the scale that we have selected. So that is one of the limitations in magnitude scale. On the other hand, on the <coughs> intensity scale, it is rather a local. Say, for example, you come here. See, in intensity, in magnitude scale, this is 500 times much larger in Chile. But in intensity scale, this becomes much because the intensity is level of destruction. So level of destruction will depend upon the soil condition, the geological formation, the building practices that uh, and the economy, many other things. Okay. So they both have their limitations. So personally, the, say for example, the big, big earthquakes that occurs, say for example, the Nepal earthquake or any other earthquake, when you go and switch on your TV, be it NDTV, anything, there will be a newsman, they will be saying, we are still waiting for the news from US Geological Survey, we are still waiting, we are comparing with the European agency, something like that. Because the US, they have the most latest and sophisticated technology. At the same time, they have the largest, you can say one of the largest number of satellites, so they can capture the information in real time. Efficiency <coughs> is very high as compared to the other countries. So what will happen? they will be in a much position to give us the information. And the second thing is, the US Geological uh, Department, they don't follow either the Richter scale, nor the Merkelis scale. They follow different scale, and that is the trend. And that is the trend, how earthquake has been measured globally. We don't that much use, especially for the higher intensity or the higher Earthquakes, we don't use Richter or Mercalis. We use different scale. Let us see what that scale is. <coughs> we use movement magnitude scale. The new scale is known as movement magnitude. And that magnitude is based on the principle of movement in physics. You don't concentrate here, just concentrate here. What what happened in the first scale, the Richter scale? It is the measurement of amount of the energy that is released. On the intensity scale, it is not a mathematical. It is just the level of destructiveness that we have measured. But here, imagine the number of dimension it has covered. So it reflects the actual occurrence of an earthquake in a much clearer picture. See, the new earthquake measurement the uh, method, that is movement magnitude method, 
covers this. The size of fault rupture means suppose there is two plate because of tectonic activity, there will be a crack in the plate itself. That is the rupture, that we call rupture, okay? So how long the rupture has created? That is one of the dimension it is capturing. The size of the fault rupture are combined by the slip displacement. Means when plate is like this, stress build up, release of the stress will slip the plate one over the other. So how much slip has taken place? That displacement. At the same time, amount of the energy release. So it has covered three important dimensions. So by covering these three important dimensions, it gives us the information in a perfect sense about what type of earthquake, how it has occurred. Okay. So these days we are using this movement magnitude scale. This is just for your reference. <coughs> this PowerPoint will be uploaded. I, the Murnal sir has told me like he will upload the PowerPoint. So for the sake of that, I've just given this. Just go through. Nepal was somewhere here and here, right? See, before last year, uh, last to last year, there was a question regarding urban heat island. Related things, environment, something geographic, related things with urban, please go through. Because it is very important. Because see, you might have studied this in other subjects also about urbanization and the problems and these are very upcoming and very challenging issues in front of us. So we don't have time, so I won't be continuing any, uh, any topic any further, but I'll just give you some points. See, urban flooding, please go through, okay? You don't need 10, 20 points. You just need three, four points to write in the exam. See, they will ask 10 or five marks. See, you are not going to write an essay. And this exam, I'm telling you again and again, this is not for PhD or MSc or BSc, nothing. Even if you don't know nothing, if you can go and write something, <coughs> you will get through. So for exam purpose, we are studying. This is the only objective. Let us be very honest with ourselves. Let us be very clear to ourselves. Let us not claim like, I am trying to gain some knowledge or I am trying to be a learned personality. <laughs> I am trying to be a Rabindranath Tagore of tomorrow, something. We are nothing. We are for examination. Prepare for the examination. All those your enlightened things will come along the way. But if you try to be enlightened before that, there will be a big problem. So first try to follow in one path, enlightenment will just follow you, okay? <laughs> so this is for example purpose. Just remember two, three points. That is good enough, two, three points. And the second most important thing is, please draw a diagram. Suppose for urban, urban flooding, please draw a diagram, just a simple diagram. Just a simple diagram. Some building structure, some like this, anything. Draw a diagram, okay. See, in urban flooding, let me tell you one thing. Urban flooding, see many other reasons, but let me tell you one very important reason. The water bodies, natural water bodies in the urban environment is encroached upon and reclaimed for development and that is one of the very crucial aspects in urban flooding. <coughs> because naturally, in a natural setup, there is a symbiotic relationship between the different processes. But, and because of that, there is a water bodies that is available in an urban setup. But we humans, we go occupy the region, and <coughs> we, we find like we need more space. So we fill up the water body, means destructing completely. So there is no escape route for the water that has been accumulated. That is how we should approach the paper, okay? So while writing the diagram, no? you can just throw some two, three water bodies. You can just say before and after, okay? <laughs> so see, this is one section. Just go. I have given enough enough points, okay, enough points. Climate change in Himalaya. Please go through. Enough points. I have given enough <coughs> points. Significance. How significant it is. <coughs> How significant. Okay. And from yesterday, yesterday's topic, let me... I was not able to finish yesterday's topic also.
Yes, this topic. Uh, climate change and food security. Okay. What is CO2 fertilization? Very simple. Just go through this. Uh, I think I have. Yeah, yeah. This one. We'll start from here. Let's see. Uh, climate change and cli uh, agriculture and climate change. Please go through. Climate change and food security. Please go through. How is it affecting? Urban agriculture. This is very important. Urban agriculture is very, very important because, see, through urban agriculture, there will be a greening of the urban environment. Second factor is the vehicular pollution will be reduced because the vehicle that will be coming from the outside to the city to feed the city citizens with vegetables will be substantially reduced. So there are many important factors. And also at the same time, vegetables will be at affordable rate to the slum dwellers and the poor in the city environment. Okay, so there are many aspects. Please go through. What is urban agriculture? I have given you very exhaustively. Climate change in Himalaya. What are their significance? Because Northeast is the region, it's a transi transition zone between India, Indo, Malaya, Indo, Chinese biographic region. It is very important. Okay. So now, thank you so much for your patience with me for five hours. And I'm and uh, once again, I wish you all the best for your upcoming examination. Thank you. Thank you.